Welcome to The Struggle is Real, a show for 20-somethings that are trying to figure out adulting. I'm your host, Justin Peters. Each episode, we focus on solving a problem that we will face throughout this defining decade that wasn't covered in the classroom. This could include topics about our career, health, relationships, and money. Let's get into it. I have a really fun episode for you today. I've been following today's guest for a few years now, and I finally got the courage to pitch him to come on the show. I'm really excited that he said yes, because he has so much amazing insight to share. Today's guest is Larry Hagner, founder of The Dad Edge. The Dad Edge is focused on empowering men to build legendary marriages, create epic connections with their kids, master personal finances, optimize their health, and become a leader within their family. This is very similar to the four pillars that I focus on with The Struggle is Real. Although you'll definitely hear stories about parenthood, most of this conversation will focus on the first pillar, building a legendary marriage. Stable, intimate relationships can present many predictable yet devious challenges like conversation boredom, sexless bedrooms, and dwindling novelty. The good news is this storyline is an editable script. Larry teaches us how he continues to show up as a better partner in his marriage. And surprise, surprise, a lot of it involves great communication. He'll share ideas on tactical empathy, labeling emotions, and mirroring without the word why. At the end, we'll also get a chance to talk about my favorite learning lesson from Larry, generative questions, and how one question led to this epic summer of family adventures in a basement full of memories. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with the 18-year husband, father of four, and the original Good Dad Project, Larry Hagner. So I know music plays an important part in the atmosphere or environment that you use it as a tool to um, create this environment whenever you're hanging out with your kids. Do you have a go-to artist or playlist that you always turn on? Dang, dude. You you really do your homework. Um, Yes. Yes, I do. So um, we, you know, I'm a big fan of, well, first of all, let me, let me just share why I think music is a, is a very powerful thing, especially with family. Right. Um, you know, so like, for instance, I, I have one of those Raptor speakers, you know, it rolls out, you know, it's really loud, that kind of thing. So, uh, one thing I've noticed when I'm playing outside with my kids, when the weather's nice, when it's not like, you know, four degrees, like it is here in St. Louis right now this week, but I will bring that speaker outside and I'll play music while we're throwing the football, while we're playing basketball, while we're doing these things. Right. Because, what I think really music really does is it music connects people. It also is something really cool that connects us back in the background. And we're, when we're listening to something auditory, right. And we're doing something that we're both experiencing. It does two things. Number one, it elevates the experience. Number two, when your kids are older, like, especially with your family, right. You'd be like, Oh, I still remember like, dude, I still remember the first song I ever kissed a girl to man. Mm. And what it song was, was that? U- it was a uh, U2. Um, the, the, the name, uh, uh, with or without you, you too. Okay. <laughs> uh, I will never forget it. Never forget it because I was at a homecoming. I was a freshman in high school. I remember like we were slow dancing and I was just like, Oh my gosh, like it just feels so right to kiss this girl right now. And I will never forget it because that was the first time I kissed that girl. And it was to, and one thing I've noticed about like, so music, like in our, in our family, we're big fans of OAR. Uh, Dave Matthews and Tim Reynolds, right? Not necessarily a big D- DMB, but but Dave Matthews and Tim Reynolds, more of the acoustic stuff. Mumford and Sons, mm. uh, Imagine Dragons, uh, those types of of artists. Uh, just my kids just like love that music, and so do we. And we call we call it the family gathering music. So as my kids get older, like one thing I've noticed, and so do I, is that when I hear that music, it brings me back to the times that we're outside playing, or the the times that we're sitting outside around the fire pit or the times that we're having like these really cool conversations as we gather as a family. Like there are times we listen to that type of music uh, while we're eating dinner. It's just kind of like low in the background. And then there are times where we're kind of blaring it right when we're outside. And uh, one of the things we just did this backyard project in in the back of my house. And Corvette. (laughs) Oh my God, you really do your, (laughs) your homework. No, it's not my Corvette, but I compare it to that a lot. Yeah. But, um, we did this backyard project with the soul and it's this, you know, it's a large patio, large fire pit. There are speakers out there. Uh, we have this inflatable screen and an outside projector that we'll put out there if, if weather permits. And we gather, we watch movies, we, we listen to music. And we, we did that for the sole purpose of let's gather 
let's listen to music, let's make memories, let's be together. And anytime, you know, a song comes on, one of my kids will be like, hey, do you remember that one time we were doing this, you know, during during that, right? And I'm like, man, that's just so cool. Yeah. Mm, that's dope, man. I love how intentional you are with environment. Um, yeah, when I heard that, I was just like, man, that's such a great idea. And I do that too, I guess subconsciously with with friends as well, gathering with friends, you put some music on and it really just does change the tone of everything. But Larry, super excited to have you on the podcast, man. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. You've been on my dream guest list for over a year now and finally got the nerves to, to reach out and ask you. And you were gracious enough to say yes right away and not even put me through the ringer. I know you from afar, consuming your content on the dad edge. And I always really enjoyed what you were doing, but the moment it hit me was when I got to actually see it in action. And I came over to your house one time, I was picking up a mutual friend that we have, and I spent maybe 10 minutes in your house. You were just getting home. Um, she was watching your kids and I got to spend some time with your kids and it was like mad chaos. You have four boys, you have four little boys. And, um, I mean, I'm sure they're well behaved, but like they're kids and they were running around and it was all kinds of craziness. And you were just getting home. Can't remember where you're coming from, but like you were unloading things and, and your two little ones were like jumping on you and everything. And I was so impressed with how patient you were. And I was like, wow, man, that guy just got the gene. He's got the patience gene. And until I started consuming more of your content and realized that you are a believer that patience is not a feeling, it's a skill, that's when things really started to click with me. So I'd love if you could tell me a little bit more about that. For sure, man. And um, let, let me just, I'll just share very authentically, right? So I, I actually created a patience masterclass. So I actually have a course that I actually sell on our website on the Data Edge. And what I just basically did with that course is, I literally took, you know, when I created that course, we were 700 plus episodes into the podcast. And at that point in time, also, we were right around four years into our mastermind, right? So uh, taking, taking obviously pearls of wisdom from amazing guests, shockingly, right? Some of my most amazing guests that, that taught skills around patience are my special operators that I've had on the show, like the Navy SEALs right? Especially the Navy SEALs and people are like, wow, right? Really? Like you learn patience from like, a, from one of the most, from the elite warriors, right? Yeah. Because Navy SEALs, the, one of the reasons they are so successful is that they can stay calm in the heat of chaos and they can think logically when, when they're under fire attack, right? Now, of course, I'm sure there's a part of them that's scared, right? Panicking a bit, but they're able to stay calm. They're able to stay resilient. They're able to respond and not react. So I took a lot of what I've learned from them. And luckily through the podcast, I've, I've created amazing friendships with a lot of these guys who are special operators. So I've, I've been able to dive even deeper into that. I've also have hired these guys to mentor me, right? To teach me the skills of, because if you really would look at what patience is, Justin, right? Patience is emotional resilience. That's really what it is. It's just packaged up and branded just a little bit differently when you talk about your kids or when you talk about things that maybe challenge us, right? It's actually emotional resilience, right? The funny thing is, is when we, when we hear the word patience, we're like, oh, well, I should just be patient. I should be, naturally be patient. But when you hear the term emotionally resilient, you're like, oh, maybe I need to be more emotionally resilient. I probably should learn how to be more emotionally resilient. But it's the same thing. It's literally the same thing. So to answer your question, my patience wasn't always so. In fact, if I'm being really honest with you, Dad Edge started because I lost my patience on my four-year-old who is now 14, right? I lost my, this was way before Dad Edge. I was frustrated. I, I, I lost my patience a lot. I never beat my kids. I never like was this crazy alcoholic that called my kids names or anything like that. I was like your typical guy that just lost his patience every now and again. And unfortunately what happened is I always told myself I am not going to ever hit my kids. I'm not gonna spank my kids. And dad edge started because I lost my cool with my four-year-old. I spanked him. And unfortunately, I spanked him hard enough where he hit the ground. That's how dad edge got started. It wasn't pretty. And it was in that moment. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm tired of not knowing what I'm doing. I need to learn. I need to figure this out. And that's how dad edge got started. But, you know, here's what I'll tell you about patience. Uh, number one, you have to realize that patience is a skill. It is not a natural feeling. Those of us who view it as like, oh, I'm a father, so I should just be naturally, I should be naturally patient. You are setting yourself up for a failure. Okay. Your your kids will test your limits like nothing else. 
you could get a bad email from your boss and have show more resilience to your boss, even though he pissed you off beyond belief than you will to your kids who just did something online. You're not going to go in your boss's office and be like, what the hell, man? Why'd you send me that email? What's wrong with you? Thank him. Boom. Right? <laughs> you could do that, right? But I mean, that's, that's a perfect example of that. You can actually be more resilient given the environment, right? And given the skill set. But when it comes to our kids, like a lot of times that's such an intimate thing. It's like, God, I'm trying to control this like raw animal, like little beast of this child, right? And when it so that's the first thing is understand that this is not a feeling. Once you understand that, you're like, oh, okay, wow, cool. I'm actually human. So cool. I can actually learn this. Awesome. So, and then the next step is you got to learn it. So you have to understand what really patience is. Patience is really being able to be resilient in the face of chaos, right? Being able to create space in between stimulus and I'm going to say response because that's what patience is. It's the difference between stimulus and boom, a reaction, right? To where it's a knee jerk reaction. Justin, I'd like to sit here and tell you that every day is sunshine and rainbows at my house. And I'm the most, I am as patient as Yoda. And that would be a lie. What I can tell you is my odds of being patient are way higher than what they used to be. I, I, I bat more like I would say 80, 20 versus 20, 80 back mm -hmm. in the day. Right. The other thing too, is that, um, you, after knowing that, Hey, I, I need to learn the skill, right? Here's, here's one of the craziest things and it's something we overlook. I'll, I'll give you a, I'll give you a spoiler and a teaser. One of the first things that I teach men when it comes to patients, I'm like, listen, man, what do you use for your alarm clock? Well, I use what, what, Justin, what do you, what do you use for your alarm clock? Your phone. Okay. Your, your phone, go, your alarm clock goes off. You get out of bed. What's the first thing you do? Turn my alarm clock off. Turn your alarm clock off. Now I know you're a pretty disciplined dude, right? But do you check it? I don't actually. <laughs> Out freaking standing. Now the majority of people, statistics show that the first thing that people lay their eyes on, 94% of people lay their eyes on their phone, right? Mm -hmm. And they immediately start looking at like, like, check this out. I don't even know what's, um, Oh, geez. Uh, Russia doesn't seem any optimism of leaving the border of the Ukraine anytime soon. That's one headline. Uh, here's another one. Omicron wave might be receding, but infections are still on the rise in 28 states. Right. I, all I did was swipe right. I have no clue. I, up until you and I were talking, I had no clue what the news said. But a lot of people like those are the alerts that pop up. So you're like, uh, right. Oh, there's the next mask mandate, right? Then notifications around your email. I don't care how busy you are, how not busy you are. If you're 10 emails deep that you haven't read yet, you immediately feel overwhelmed, right? Mm -hmm. Then a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll, they'll drink their coffee, they'll go to the bathroom, they'll scroll through social media, and then they'll see other people's highlight reel, which by the way, is not true. Uh, and then they'll be like, uh, why is my life not as good as that? I used to date that girl. She looks so happy. Yeah. Uh, my marriage is not the best. Like, God bless. Like, look at her family. Uh, and immediately you haven't even been up for 15 minutes and you feel like total crap. You're already what I call triggered. You're triggered. And I call that the domino effect. You start your day like that. And it's a domino effect. You, you have done the one thing that is now going to decimate your patients. You go to work, you have these things that challenge you. Boom, 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 boom. These triggers, right? You get home, you're exhausted. Now, not only have you been triggered all day, you haven't built resilience and you don't know the skills of resilience, and you've been triggered all day, now you come home and now you have to be dad, right? And this is the most, and you gotta be husband. The two most important jobs that any man will tell you that is the most important, most critical thing. So therefore the stakes are high, the pressure is high. It's like, man, I, I, I gotta go in and be my best. I gotta go in and my, be my best. I can't be, I can't be an ass tonight. I can't be impatient tonight. You know, and what we say, whatever we focus on expands. Whenever you say, I can't be this, like, for instance, if I'd be like, hey, I, I, I can't eat bad tonight. I got to stay away from the Twinkies. I, I can't drink alcohol tonight, right? Whatever we focus on, your brain doesn't hear can't. It's going to think, oh, alcohol. Oh, hmm. Twinkies, right? So when we say like, you know, I, I, can't, I can't lose my patience tonight. You're already setting yourself up for, for failure because you're thinking that. So uh, what happens is, is now a man is tired. His willpower, your willpower actually does, it's clinically proven your willpower does decrease over the day. And then we do one of two things. We're either tested and we react 
or we avoid, right? And that's not good either. Neither one of those are good. But if you had the skill to actually build resilience throughout the day, that's why I teach in that course how to build it, right? Instead of decimate it. Uh, you're much more likely to execute very, very well in the evening. And the, the last thing I'll say is this, you're human. You're going to be triggered. Dude, I'm triggered, right? My kids will say something. My kids will do something. I have to repeat myself three, three or four times. I'm triggered now, right? But I also recognize, I'm like, oh, there's that trigger. There's that trigger. And what most people do is when we're triggered, we self-sabotage. That shouldn't piss me off. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm an impatient person. Like I, I've told my kid four times I'm ineffective, right? Then we'll start to self-sabotage. So it's understanding like, what am I triggering here? And then most importantly, what do I go do about it? Right. What do I go do about it? Like I could literally get my kid's face and be like, get off your phone. This is the fourth time I've told you empty the dishwasher. Damn it. Right. But instead I'll be like, he's not listening. Now I'm just going to slow it down a little bit. And one thing is way more effective. Listen, Justin, if anything for your audience, the measure of a man is how he responds. Mm. A measure of a good man is not a man in rage. A measure of a good man is not a man who's out of control. And listen, I'm preaching to the choir here. Like, dude, like, listen, I need to slap myself upside the head. I've, I've lost control. You know, it's how dad edge got started. I still lose control. I just do it a lot less, but I'll go up to my son and I'll say, son, um, I've asked you four times to empty the dishwasher. You've got about 10 seconds um, before you lose the phone. You know, this is your job. Am I wrong? Nope. You're not wrong, dad. Boom. Mm. Now, if I lose my cool and yell and scream, he'll get up. Or I'll just ask the question like, Hey man, I've asked you a couple of times. What's your job? My job is to empty the dishwasher. Okay, cool. What do you think you should do? I should empty the dishwasher. And then he'll be like, get up and do it. Mm -hmm. Instead, if I lost it and went into a rage, he'd be like, God, man, my, you know, excuse me for cursing, but um, my dad's an asshole. Yeah. And what, whatever, dude, I'll get up and I'll empty your dishwasher and you're an asshole, mm -hmm. like under his breath, right? So there are ways that you can effectively handle things, right? And then sometimes it's literally the, the, the more powerful thing to do is actually to be some, at times more gentle, um, talk a little bit slower. And it's amazing what happens. And also to ask a question, not necessarily give the command, ask the question. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. I, I think that's really, really important. I, a, a few thoughts that came out of that, that I'm trying to organize in my head right now. I, love slowing it down. You even, you use a lot of priming too. I noticed and like going back to your example of you get done with work, you probably were triggered all this entire time at work, just a reset, like either getting out of your car, you know, you pull into the driveway and you take, and this is, this is your advice. Um, I'm regurgitating. You take two minutes to really think about who do I want to show up over the next, um, this evening, like over the next three to five hours, what do I, what do I want to present? Um, and coming at it from what I want, because once again, the whole Google thing, you're, you'll focus on, you know, you'll, you'll focus on whatever you're, you're asking, whatever questions you're asking. So once again, it's what you want, not what you don't want in that case. And then if you're like, okay, well, I don't really necessarily have that moment. I'm, I'm working from home right now too. I believe, I'm not sure if you're still doing it, but you set the alarm on like 10 minutes before your kids came home. And, um, that triggered you to start getting into, that mindset and, and priming yourself. Okay. I'm, I'm moving into dad mode now. I'm, I'm coming out of, of work mode. I'm moving into dad mode. My right. favorite, um, my favorite things in the world are coming home in 10 minutes. So what yeah. do I want to show up with again? So I love that piece of advice. Um, back to the spanking story now too, that really, I guess is the impetus for the dad edge previously known as the good dad project. Um, and spoiler alert, you are the good dad, um, the good dad project, which I, yeah. I love that, uh, catch line there. Still am. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but but that really wasn't the impetus for, for wanting to be a good dad. I think we'd have to go back even further than that with, with your childhood and what fatherhood looked like throughout that. Tell me about, so I, you can correct me on dates, but I'm pretty sure it was like 1971 that your mom and dad, or yeah, that your um, uh, parents were married and then divorced in 1975. They had you and um, the divorce happened somewhere around like nine months and you really didn't have a father figure that showed up until four years later. 
tell me about that moment when he walked into your door, um, what you thought fatherhood w- was, and then what you learned about fatherhood over the next, I don't know, two or three decades. Wow. Um, I've been on a lot of podcasts, Justin. I've never known anybody who has done their homework like you have. Uh, <laughs> unbelievable. And thank you for that, man. So, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. That's just, that's just unreal. It just proves to your skill. Um, I just want to talk real quick. I'm happy to talk about that. I want to talk real quickly about what you talked about, uh, which is like creating like that 10 minutes. Yeah. So, honestly, man, sometimes it's just two minutes, right? Um, so psychologically, this doesn't, and, and I want to speak to your audience in particular, psychologically as human beings, right? Whether it's your girlfriend, whether it's your boyfriend, whether it's uh, people you work with, whether it's your kids, it really doesn't matter. The first 45 seconds of a new interaction will, with someone will dictate the next 40 minutes mm. with that person. So like, for instance, um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. If I come in and, and I have, and there are still days where I do, like some days I get beaten up a little bit, right? And I'll walk out of this office. I don't take that two minutes. I don't think about like, hey, what am I going to go create? You know, what type of connections am I going to go create? Sometimes I just go in like freaking like walk out there with my tail between my legs and my kids will read that. They, they read it from a mile away, especially my older ones. And even my eight-year-old will read it, be like, are you okay? Did you have a bad day? And I'm like, they see it, right? What's going on, right, is that when you when you walk into a room with a cloud over your head, people are like, oh, I now have to operate probably in this particular way so I don't make things worse for this person. I don't want to trigger this person. It's kind of like you feel like walking on broken glass a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. But if you come in, and we've all seen those people, right, they come and be like, hey, Justin, dude, man, how you been, man? It's been a long time. Like, how have you been? How's the podcast? Like immediately before you and I hit record, right? That elevates the energy. That's going to elevate the, you know, the podcast. That's going to elevate our interaction and our connection. So one piece of advice that I give men, anywhere you are, it doesn't matter if you're in the workplace, doesn't matter you know, if you're getting coffee from the barista, that first 40 second interaction will dictate the next 40 to 45 minutes of your interaction and the energy, right? On the flip side, I tell my guys who are coaches in our mastermind, right? Um, that the first five minutes, the first, same thing, first 40 seconds to five minutes of our group coaching environment is will dictate the energy of the entire call. Because if you start on a low point, it's hard as hell to recover, Right. So I wanted to make sure people knew that, make sure that, you know, the first 40 seconds of any, any interaction will dictate the next 40 minutes yeah, to answer your question. Out. Yeah. To answer your question. Um, yeah. My mom, I, I didn't know that I had a biological father at the age of four. My mom met a man. I, I just, I was raised by my mom. They got divorced. Um, never knew my dad. Um, I actually, in my four-year-old brain, like I thought men go out and find dads. Right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Women go out and find dads for the family. Like they, that's how they appear. Men were coming to pick up, you know, kids in preschool. I clearly remember this. I actually clearly remember a guy in a suit, a black and black suit, uh, coming to pick up his kid from preschool. And I remember like, oh, that's a dad. You know, mom must have found the dad. <laughs> My mom brings home this guy for the first time when I was four, and I never have seen a man in my house. You know, so this guy walks in, he's got a trench coat on, he's got a three piece suit on, he's a white collar data software engineer for Citicorp at the time. My mom met him through work. And literally, this man comes walking in my house, and I had never seen like this powerful male figure, right? And I was like, oh my gosh, it's like that must be what a dad is, right? And the first question I asked this guy was, are you going to be my dad? Larry, this is Joe. Joe, this is Larry. Are you going to be my dad? As I'm shaking his hand with this big smile on my face, like, right? It just was super awkward. You know, my mom and him were married for six years. And to be just quite frank and honest, right? I think my mom took that as a sign. Um, You know, like, man, I really do need to find a father for this kid, right? I don't think my mom actually really loved the guy. I think she loved the idea of our family being complete and the fact that I was so excited about it. So I think that's to be real honest, I think that's why she married him. Hmm. And I think that that came back and really bitter in the rear end, because when you're marrying somebody for the wrong reasons like that, eventually that's going to show up. Right. So every year that they were married, their fights just got worse and worse and worse. Uh, you know, my dad was a very nice person. He adopted me. That's why I have a last name Hagner. He adopted me. He's very nice when he was sober. He was big on manners. Yes, sir. No, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. May I please excuse me dude, if I didn't use those words, like, oh, I, I felt it, you know, like, boom, like kind of like a little nudge. 
little tap in the back of the head, yep. like little kind of punch to the arm. Thank you. Say thank you. you know, <laughs> excuse me. Do not interrupt. Right. So the longer they were together, my dad drank more and more and more and their, their relationships got worse and worse and worse. Yeah. You know, he would beat my mom. Um, he beat me up. Um, it was horrible, but to be honest, like that's the way I thought families rolled. Like I didn't know any better. Like, it's not like you're talking to your friends. Like, yeah, I got my ass kicked last night. You know, my mom was held down, restricted. I woke up in the middle of the night. She was screaming. I tried to peel my dad's hands off of her. And then he drugged me in my room, like by my neck. Like you didn't have those conversations when you were in third and fourth grade. And, but I just thought like, oh, it was just the way everybody rolls. Uh, they got divorced when I was 10. I've never seen the guy since. Um, I take that back. I always say that, but I did see him one, one other time. I was 21. Interesting. I never heard you say this before. Yeah. My, my dad was a, it's just easier to say I never saw him again. Cause even okay. when I saw him again, it was so short and awkward and weird that I just don't even talk about it, but I will. Um, I was 21. I was a third year college student and I was dating a girl. We came back to St. Louis for, I don't know, it was like spring break or something like that. And she was home. I was home. I was like, Hey, I was like, Hey, you want to go? We got our friends go. I was like, Hey, you want to go to this bar? And there's like 10 of us. The guy working the door checking IDs was my dad. Wow. And I nudged this girl and I have never told this story. Cause like I said, it's just easier to say I never saw him again because I don't even count that. And I looked at him. I looked at the girl and I go, see the guy, um, checking IDs at the door. She's like, yeah, I was like, that's, that's my father. It's my stepfather. She's like, what? She's like, when was the last time you saw him? I was like 11 years ago when they were married. I haven't heard from him since. She's like, are you going to say anything to him? I was, and I, at that point I was like, you know, you're 21 and kind of like, you know, you want to kind of start some shit, not start shit, but you want to kind of like poke the bear a little bit. And, uh, he looks at my, I didn't say anything to him. And he, he looks at my ID and he's like, look at my ID. And he's like, oh my God, Larry. And I'm like, Hey, how's it going? Oh, he's God. like, um, wow. Um, wow. Wow. Um, what are you doing here? I was like, I'm, I'm with my friends to like, go. Oh. He's like, well, Hey, no cover for any of your friends. And I'm like, thanks. And, um, you know, he let us in and then he kind of like pulls me aside. He's like, Hey son, he goes, Hey son, which, which girl is yours? And I told him, he's like, Ooh, Ooh, wow. She's beautiful. I was like, thanks. And, um, we got in and that was it. That was the only interaction. And the girl I was, and I was very, I would say stoic that night. Like very like, like it really kind of hit me. And she's like, "Are you okay?" And I'm like, "And what do you do?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm fine." She's like, "You just saw your dad, like at the door. Are you sure you're okay?" Yeah, I'm fine. Do you want to leave? Nope, I'm fine. And that was it. And then we left. And I said, and literally my my goodbye to him was like, "Well, see you later." That was it. Um, But yeah, so my mom, you know, they got divorced when I was 12, I really started asking a lot of questions. Cause at this point in time, like birds and the bees, you learn stuff. And I'm like, Hey, I was like, mom, I was like, why was I in your wedding? <laughs> right. I was like, why was I in you and Joe's wedding? And she's like, well, yeah, I was, I was married before Joe. And I'm like, wait, wait, what you were married before? Like, she's like, yeah, to your father. I was like, I have another father. She's like, yeah. She's like, his name is yours. Actually, Larry. She goes, actually, you're real name isn't Larry Lawrence Joseph Hagner. It's actually Lawrence Dale Boyd. I changed it when your dad adopted you at four. And I'm like, wow. Okay. Well, what, what does this guy look like? She's like, I have the wedding albums and I saw him and I was like, oh my God, he kind of looks like me. This is crazy. Very <laughs> surreal. And then as fate would have it when I was 12, um, I was able to actually meet him and had a very brief six month relationship with him. And it happened by accident. It did not happen on purpose. And if you want me to tell the story, yeah, I please actually. Okay. So I was 12. Um, it was right around Christmas time. I remember because it was cold. I went up to this rec center with a friend of mine to play basketball. It's like what we did all the time. It was terrible basketball, though. but it was great. We, we just had fun. So I go to get my basketball from the front desk and I hear this guy behind the front desk go, he looks outside at this woman who's walking. You know, she's like 50 feet from the door walking. And he's like, oh, here comes Mrs. Boyd with the hockey payment. I was like, oh, that's really weird. That's my, that's my father's last name, who I had obviously never met. I only saw his picture. And me, I'm a curious 
young boy, right? Very curious, very bold. And I was like, what did you say the name was? He said, Lisa Boyd. And I go, you wouldn't happen to know her husband, would you? He goes, oh yeah, he plays hockey up here all the time. That's, she's coming up here to pay the ice, ice fees. His name's Larry. And I'm like, wow, what are the freaking chances of that? Like, could this be the same guy? Like, I, I don't know. So I go up to this lady because I had no idea if my dad was remarried or not. For all I knew, my dad would lived in Timbuktu. So this lady pays the payment. I'm like literally like 10 feet away from her. I'm like waiting for her to be done. And I just walk up to her. I tap her on the shoulder. I'm like, hey, I was like, excuse me. And she looks at me like, yeah, yeah, can I help you? And I was like, what's your name? And she like looks at me like totally puzzled. She's like, my name's Lisa. And I was like, Lisa, what? And even more puzzled. She's like, Lisa Boyd, why? And I was like, are you married to a guy named Larry? And now she's like really like befuddled. And then she's like, yes. And I was like, this sounds weird but I think your husband might be my dad. And she was like, then all of a sudden you just saw like the light bulb go off. Right. And she looks at me and she goes, honey, are you Larry? And I go, yes, I am. Like big smile on my face. Like, yeah, yes, I am. And she's like, would you like to talk to your dad? Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I would. That would be awesome. She said, okay. Takes me around the corner, pay phones, puts a quarter in, dials the number. And she's like, Hey, um, guess what? And he's like, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so I'm up here at the civic center. I paid the hockey payment. Uh, I ran it to your son, your 12 year old son. He'd like to talk to you. You want to talk to him? And she just hands the phone right over. And I, you know, I'm, I'm shaking, right? I can't, Justin, I don't even remember what we said. All I remember was, I remember the sound of his voice. He's like, uh, Hey, 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 how, how are you? I'm like, dad. Yeah, yeah. How are you doing? I'm like, I'm, I'm fine. He's like, where do you go to school? Like, just start asking me questions. Like, I can't remember. All I know is we talked and she wrote her number down on a piece of paper and she's like, Hey, this is our number. So be it. If anything, you want to talk to him again. I went home. I told my mom, she was not happy about it. Their, their relationship ended terrible, right? Really bad. And, um, I told my mom, I was like, I really want to meet him. Like, I really, really want to meet him. And she's like, he's your father. I'm not on board with it, but okay. So I met him. Uh, we met and I'll never forget it. I even remember what I wore. You remember the show Miami Vice? I know the show, but I, yeah. I don't, I've never really watched it. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. This is really aging me, but like, so Cro <laughs> Crockett and Tubbs, like back in the day, right? Um, like these suits that you roll up the sleeves with the freaking sports. I'll get a quick visual on myself right here. <laughs> oh yeah. It's, it was, it was, Oh, I thought it was a money suit. Right. Cause back then it kind of was, but it, Oh my God, <laughs> you couldn't get more douchey, I guess. But anyway, I wore that. <laughs> I want to look my best. I show up, uh, we hug each other. And then that day forward, I got to know him. He was remarried, obviously at the time, two-year-old son, another one on the way. And we hung out, man, all the time. He came to my little league games I uh, called him dad right out from the get, right from the get go. And um, it was probably like five months into our relationship, like things kind of started to change. And the best way I can describe it, Justin, is that, you know, if you know, we've all dated people in our lives, whether you're a man or a woman listening to the show, we've all dated people and they're giving you every indication that they just ain't into you anymore. They just haven't said it yet. It's like, oh, it's just a matter of time before she, she dumps me. Like, it's just feeling it, right? I can tell she's not into it anymore. That's about the feeling that I got. Didn't identify it at the time. I just knew something was off. So I called him one day and I'm like, hey, man. I was like, is everything okay? Like, I don't really hear from you anymore. Like, when I'm around you, like, it feels like something's wrong. Like, are we, are we okay? Like, that was basically the premise. And I don't remember what he said because I was too upset. And it basically was, hey, it's me, not you. It's not a good time. We I don't know if this is going to work out long-term. All I know is I called him an asshole and I hung up on him and that was it. And then, yeah, my mom was married a total of three times. Uh, every guy she dated or married was the same character, big drinker, big partier, drugs, alcohol, abusive, start off on like this amazing, like, Oh my God, I found the guy. Right. And then it would just turn into absolute freaking disaster, man. And to where, like, by the time I was like 15 and there was this one dude who was living this for a while and he was him and his son, he, they, that, that was like the freaking epitome of a nightmare. I mean, I had a knife held to my throat at one point. I had a gun pointed at me at one point. I mean, it was absolute craziness. 
And I just spent the night at friends' houses all the time. And then, um, you know, my mom got remarried one more time when I was about 19. He was a pretty good guy, but same thing, heavy part, big partier. Um, but yeah, I went away to college, graduated college, um, got into pharmaceutical sales. And yeah, by the time I was 30, I'd been married for a couple of years, first son on the way. And I was in a Starbucks for a business meeting, Monday morning business meeting with my sales team in Starbucks here in St. Louis, sitting there. This gentleman, for some reason, caught my eye when he walked in, and I knew exactly who he was. It was my father, my real father, my biological father. And I was like, holy crap, here it is again, right? And I'm with one of the women that I was with uh, on our sales team. She's like, are you all right? Like, like, hello, you look like you just seen a ghost. I was like, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I was like, look, I was like, um, my father just walked in. And she's like, excuse me? I was like, and my father just walked in and she, we, she and I were close enough and friends enough. She knew the story. She's like, like your biological father. I'm like, yeah. She's like, when was the last time you saw him? I was like, I was 12, you know? And she's like, what, what are you going to go? She, now she's like, Oh, what are you going to go say to him? I'm like, nothing. She's like, wait, you're going to let your father walk out of here and not say anything to him. I'm like, yeah. I was like, it's been, he's never really been a part of my life. He was for like five months. I was like, but no, what am I going to say? Without another word, without one word, she just got up and went over to him. She didn't even say like, hey, I'm going to go talk to him. She just got up and went over to him. I was like, oh my God, what is she doing? He was sitting down there, sitting on a couch. And I was like, oh my God, do I run? Do I go to the bathroom? Do I stay here? Do I hit him? Like, what do I do? I couldn't, they were too far away and it was too loud. I couldn't hear them, but I could read his lips. And all I, heard, all I could see him say was, where is he? And he started looking around and then like our eyes met. And I'm like, oh my God, this just got really freaking real. And he just gets up, comes over humbly, extends his hand. He's like, Hey, you know, how are you? I'm like, fine. How are you? Like, I wasn't nice, but I wasn't a complete jerk, but I was just sure. kind of like cold, you know, he's like, well, are, he asked me and her, are you married to get, I'm like, no, I was like, we work together. I I'm actually married, been married for two years. I'm expecting my first son actually. He's like, oh, that's great. You know? And like, what do you do for a living? I was like, I'm in medical device sales and blah, blah, blah. He's like, oh, that sounds great. And where do you live? And all that stuff. And then before he left, he's like, you know, we should really go out to breakfast. And I think I kind of just said, well, listen, man, you, you don't have to do this. He's like, no, no, I, I want to. And I'm like, well, listen, this is my card at the time. They're business cards. I was like, here's my card. I was like, if you want to, you want to get together, you know, this is how you find me. And I expected that he was just going to probably just take the easy way out. And that was it. Well, the next day I got an email that was like a didactic, yeah. right? Like this dissertation. And I read it. It was very humble and basically regretting that decision and why. And the things that he had thought about over the past 18 years, very touching email. So I agreed to meet with him for, for breakfast. And I'll finish the story here. Um, I went out to breakfast with my dad and I remember it was the most awkward freaking meal I've ever had in my life. And I was just sitting there like, what do I, what am I going to talk to him about? What am I going to ask him? Like, what can we talk about? What can't we talk about? Which, am I going to say something to offend him? Right. Or anything like that. So I remember like me, like controlling the conversation and just asking him questions. And then finally I just put my, my fork down. And I was like, you know what? I was like, I got to be honest with you, man. I was like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing here. And I was like, and I don't even know if anything's going to happen after this breakfast. All I know is I'm stressed out and I don't know what rules we're supposed to follow here. And I don't know. And my dad leaned in and this is, this was like super cool thing that I was like, wow, this man is so human. He looked at me and he goes, you think I do? Mm. And I was like, wow. He's like, I don't know either. He's like, but I'm willing to find out if you wow. are. Yeah. And I'm like, whew. I was like, okay. Now past 17 years, we've had this relationship. I have two younger half brothers. He's still married to the same woman. I make my dad sound like a bum. He's not, he's a uber successful entrepreneur in the electrical industry. Um, and yeah, we've had a relationship ever since, but yeah, that's, that's the story. That was my template growing up. That's cool, man. Thanks for sharing the story. Never heard the, um, your stepdad bar story. That was really fascinating. Really yeah. interesting that you had 
females almost nudge you a little bit. Each one of those like chance encounters that you ran into, like at, yeah. at 12, it was, it was your biological dad's, uh, uh, wife, you know, and, and she kind of, Hey, you want to talk to him? Like kind of provoked that piece to yeah, it. it that um, <laughs> you're, you're at the bar. It was your girlfriend. I don't know if that was Jessica at the time or not. Um, that kind of probed you a little bit more to think through what that interaction was going to be. And then your coworker, of course, there at the end. So clearly there's this like foundation of strong women in your life. And, um, I mentioned your wife's name, Jessica. I want to shift the conversation towards that because you have yeah. so much amazing things to share about creating exceptional marriages. And, um, it's, it's really fascinating. I think the origin story laid a lot of the framework for, for this and who you wanted to be and where you're going, um, with everything, but you, you have the saying that every woman really has three needs and that's to be seen, to be heard and to be connected. And that was like an obvious to me, but what I took away was what might be obvious for us is (laughs) what is true around those things? Like me, like thinking that I'm showing up and helping her be seen and be heard and be connected aren't actually what's happening. And like, we have the very obvious, like they come to us and they want to share kind of problem, but we're looking at it from the fix it side and we're just trying to fix and they're just trying to vent piece to it. So to get into a little bit of the, the actual tangibles of the technical piece to it, you have this phrase, tactical empathy. Can you tell me a little bit about what that is? Yeah, for sure. Um, tactical empathy. And yeah, yeah, it's it's changed a little bit. So I would say definitely seen, heard, uh, safe, right, is 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 actually the big three. I used to say connected, but it's really safe. Um, another one that's right in line with like the safe is valued. You know, the other one is loved, right? But it's right in line with those three themes, right? Now, when it comes to tactical empathy, I, I can't take credit for like that actual term, um, that's Chris Voss's term. I, I, I don't know, know if he has IP around that or not, but I always like to give credit where credit's due. I, I learned tactical empathy through Chris Voss. Chris Voss, Chris Voss is the former chief hostage negotiator for the FBI. He's killer, man. <laughs> oh, he's so like, listen. You had him on your um, show, didn't you? Twice. Yeah. Oh, nice. Um, he's so good. At, like, listen, his big thing, his big shtick, right, is negotiation. But if you really look at what Chris is brilliant at, it's communication. Mm-hmm. And it's making the other side feel heard, making the other side feel seen and safe. That's what he does. That's how he gets hostages out of situations. That's how he gets, a, that's how you can connect to a guy who's a terrorist, right? Is that you don't fight verbally with a terrorist, they'll lose their mind. You have to make a terrorist feel safe and connected to you in order to negotiate with you. So it's kind of funny when I had Chris on and this was the second time and I was like, dude, I was like, yeah. Your book is called Never Split the Difference. You know, negotiate like your life is dependent on it. I was like, you should have named this book like freaking Jedi Master of Communication or something <laughs> like that. And he just laughed. He's like, yeah, but then nobody would buy it. You know, like that's <laughs> kind of how he talks. But um, if you really look at what Chris does, it's brilliant for any modality of communication. And I would venture to say, especially in um in in marriage, not that you have to negotiate like your life depends on it, but taking those, some of those, some of his elements, right. And then looking at it through the lens, you have to tweak them quite a bit, looking at them through the lens of your wife. Now, Justin, let's just level set. Like we're both men. If I come to you as a man and I share a struggle or a challenge or a problem that I'm having, dude, I'm not looking to vent. And for you to just hear me, that's part of it. But what I'm really looking for you to do is tell me what you think I should do. Right. Men are very logical right? We're problem solvers. And that's what we want from each other. Like if I come to you with a problem, it's because I want you to tell me like, Hey, I'm in financial issues. Tell me how you're, you know, I'm having communication issues, whatever. I want you to tell me what you think I should do or your experiences of what, what have, how it's impacted you and what you've done. Our wives are different. I would like to say, and I'm not trying to put all wives in every single conversation in the same box, because there are times where your wife is looking for you to help her find a solution. So there are those times, but for the most part, let's call it 70, 30. I actually don't know the statistics. All I know is more often than not what your wife is doing when she's venting to you about something, what she's really looking for is, did you hear me? You know, did you see me? Can we connect on this a little bit? Like it's, it's, it's an outreach of, for them to connect with you right now. I'll give you a great example of this. Okay. Even female to female. 
So my wife and my mother-in-law are really, really tight, really, really tight. They're, they're like best friends. Um, however, my wife is actually very picky with some of the things she goes to my mother-in-law about because my mother-in-law immediately goes to solutions. Well, you should do this. Well, you know, hey, you need to watch out for this. If that's the case, you you got to be thinking about this and you you should really be doing this. <laughs> and my wife is like, oh, I just don't want to hear that. Like, I just want my mom to hear me, right? So, you know, even woman to woman that that shows up, right? But for when it comes to us as men, when your wife, you know, if you come home, you ask her like, hey, how was your, how was your day? Which I hate that question, but she does. And she starts venting with you about like some of the challenges of the day. What we want to do as men, and we do it for a couple of different reasons, we want to solve that problem because and it comes from such a noble place. It comes from a loving place. Like, let me take your pain away. Let me show you the blind spot here so we can just get through this and we can go both get back to feeling a whole lot better, right? And what is actually happening from an emotional standpoint, men, believe it or not, I think most men will agree. We don't like to admit it. We don't have the highest emotional IQ. Yeah. <laughs> right. We, we've been told from, from freaking birth, stuff down your feelings, don't cry, you know, put your head down, get through it. Mm -hmm. Right. So when people have emotion coming at us, right. High, high impact, high velocity emotion. Right. Even with our kids, when our kids are like, blah, 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 you're just like, ah, oh, so, dude, <laughs> calm down. It's because it's hard for us to actually absorb that emotion because we're just not taught how to do that. It makes us feel uncomfortable. So we actually want to solve problems to make them feel better, solve their problem. We also want to make us feel better. And we want to work together as a team, right? And it's like, oh man, team, we just did it. We just overcame, right? But what your wife is really looking for in those moments is like, hey, did you hear me? Do you see me? The easiest way to, to, to use tactical empathy is a few different skill sets that Chris teaches. Um, we've tweaked them a little bit as it pertains to marriage. But one of the things he's brilliant at is labeling. Just simply emotion, just labeling someone's emotion that they probably feel. So like, for instance, sounds like you're angry right now. Uh, man, that's overwhelming. Of course you're overwhelmed. Holy crap. What a day. Like, tell me more. Right. Mm -hmm. That's when you, so when I use the word overwhelmed and by the way, emotions are one word, you know, sad, happy, depressed, disgusted, exhausted, over, whatever. Right. But what, when my wife is venting to me, what I am actually looking for is what does she feel? right? I'm listening to the words. I'm listening to the body language. What is she feeling? So I can help identify it. Right. And even if I label the, the, the emotion wrong and she corrects me, it's still a win because what happens to that person psychologically is they feel they're deescalated when they're, when they're labeled properly. So you could even be like, man, it sounds like you're overwhelmed. And sometimes I'll be like, no, I'm, I'm fucking pissed. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'd be like, and because she identified that, what you've done is you force contemplation. They're like, no, I'm actually pissed. The moment of that being the identifier, you, you immediately feel calmer. You're like, oh, yeah, that, that's exactly what I feel. Yeah. And then, so that's one thing is labeling that emotion. Sometimes that's all you have to do. And actually, after you've labeled an emotion, man, it feels like you are so overwhelmed right now. And why wouldn't you be? And then I just let silence do the work. Because as soon as I shut up, what do you think she's going to do? You got to talk some more. <laughs> yeah, tell me more, right? The other thing too, I'm a big fan of, uh, and I don't know if this is Chris's or not, mirroring has been around forever, right? Yeah. But Chris is a big fan. So people know what mirroring is, but I love Chris's spin on it, which is repeating the last three words that somebody said and not using the word why. Because subconsciously, the word why will put somebody on the defense. So if I come home and my wife is like, oh my God, I was so overwhelmed today. Like, um, yeah, I'm trying to schedule, and this, this is a real story, trying to schedule a birthday dinner with all my girlfriends. I have this one girlfriend who is freaking freaked out about COVID and she wants to go sit outside. It's January. We can't sit outside. This other person doesn't like Mexican food. This other person is thinking about going here. I'm trying to please everybody and I'm really overwhelmed. Now, the one of the worst things I could do is be like, why are you overwhelmed about that? doesn't sound like such a big deal. Make your own decision. They'll follow you. Like, right. As a man, that's like, this is an easy one. <laughs> but instead in that moment, I'll mirror her and be like, you're overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. Like I, to be honest, like I want everybody to have fun. I want to go to the place. I want to go for my birthday. I don't want people to be paranoid about COVID, you know? So right there when I mirrored her, like I just saw her again, I actually used her words. She's going to tell me more. 
she's going to feel seen, heard, and safe because I used her words. And I didn't say, well, why do you feel that way? Why do you feel overwhelmed? All I did was identify, like, you feel overwhelmed? Yeah. And then she's going to tell me why, right? But I did it. One is an invite and one is an insult. And you have to make sure that when you're doing that, that you, you use the invite, which is mirroring. The last and final thing that I personally think, there's several skill sets within tactical empathy, but is voice tone. Um, Chris likes to talk about this as the FM, the late night FM DJ voice. This work, and by the way, these skills work great with your kids too, if you have kids. Um, so your voice will either um, insult somebody, stress somebody out, or escalate somebody. Or you can, it'll do the opposite. It'll make somebody feel calmer. It will deescalate and they'll feel more connected to you. So I could be like, Justin, what's up with that cake in the background? Right? Or what's, what's up with that cake in the background, right? Yeah. Now, I want you to take note. Don't talk yet, but I want you to take note. How did that feel? Now, you'd be like, Justin, dude, what's up with that cake in the background, man? Now, what were the differences that you felt in the two? I used the exact same words. All I changed was the tone. What did yeah. you feel? First one felt very defensive. Like I need to justify reasoning for what the cake was. Right. The second one was offensive. It was an invite to share yeah. more about the story of what that was. Exactly. So, so your voice tone, you can use the exact same words in an interaction and one's an insult and one's an invite. So, and this again, works great with kids. If you really want to really be, if you want to do this in the simplest, simplest way possible, slow the cadence of your voice to 75% of the speed. So let me, let me share a difference, right? Slow your voice to 75% of the speed or slow your voice to 75% of the speed. Which one felt easier to you? Second one by far. Right. <laughs> first probably one was chaotic. Right. <laughs> right. The first one you're probably like, I didn't even hear the words. It just <laughs> jarred me a bit, right? So easiest thing you can do, slow your roll when you're trying to make someone feel safe, to feel seen and heard, right? It also will slow you down. So like we talked about patience early on. If you want to calm yourself down and when you want to go rage, slow your own voice down. You'll also calm you down and them. Mm. It's, it's an amazing skill. That's so simple that most of us don't even know it. I would agree. I love all of those. I almost automatically assume that Gabby, my girlfriend just wants to be heard. There's no solution involved in it. She's very good about telling me if, if, Hey, I need your opinion on this or I, I what would you do here? If she doesn't say that, I'm just assuming that she needs to be heard. And sometimes yeah. I'm better at that than others, but all of those tactics are really great. One thing that you brought up was the fact that you hate the question, how was your day? And I yeah. think this dovetails into generative questions, which I absolutely love. This was like my favorite takeaway from researching you. Dang, um, I was I, I was super excited about it and I've been practicing it over, over the last couple of weeks. I think it's actually good. I've been, of course, practicing it with Gabby, but I've also been practicing it with my coworkers and I work from home and I get on a lot of zoom calls. And the first question is always just like, how was your day? Um, so you have a slight rephrase on that. So let's talk a little bit about what generative questions are and what's a better question than how was your day? Yeah. So I learned about generative questions through, um, I have two different coaching certifications. One is in a discipline called exchange, um, otherwise known as appreciative inquiry. I could talk for 30 minutes on what AI is and I won't, but basically what AI is, is, it's basically identifying the best of what was, the best of what is, and the best of what could be. And the way that we're wired as human beings is we're trying to solve problems, right? And what we don't realize is, is that focusing on the problem will not get you to the solution. You have to ask yourself better questions. And I'll give you an example. Why can't I be a more patient father? You know, your brain is like Google. It's going to search whatever you put in that search bar. Oh, you want to know why you're not a patient father? It's because of this. You ain't in shape. You have enough money. You're miserable at your job. You're not having sex with your wife. Like your brain will tell you this crap, right? And then we wonder like, why am I spiraling out of control and self-sabotaging? That's why. But instead reframing the question, how might I be a more patient father? Well, I could go buy Larry's course. No, <laughs> I'm just kind of kidding. <laughs> uh, but no, it's like, well, you know, I could, I could read a book. I could read Unbeatable Mind by Mark Devine, right? It's a great book on resilience and mental toughness. I could, you know, go see a counselor, like maybe one or two sessions, just give me some skills on how I can be more patient with my kids. Immediately solution-based 
answers start to come to mind because of the question. So that's what generative questions are. Generative questions are meant to generate ideas, vision, right? Now, when it comes to generative questions with other people, right? Everyone is in this default, everyone. And if you're listening to this podcast, here's my challenge for you. Never, ever from this day forward, ask someone, how was your day, right? How is your day, right? Don't do that because people will answer it with one word. They can answer that in their sleep. And it's a def- it's a crappy question that will get you a crappy answer usually, right? So a generative question is to create connection. It's to create conversation. And it's to create higher energy, right? People feel better when they're talking about things that bring them energy and joy. So like, for instance, I'll ask my kids, what was the best part of your day today? I love that. You know? The other thing I'll, and I'll, I'll vary that up a little bit. Like with my eight year, I'll be like, Hey man, tell me one thing that made you smile today. Mm. Tell me the story. Right. Or tell me something that made you laugh today. Right. Tell me something that you're proud of today. Right. And I'll even ask it like that. Not like, how was your day? How was school? Tell me something you're proud of today. And they will light up like dad, like I scored a goal in PE. (laughs) Right now. I'm not just going to go to the next question and be like, dude, that's amazing. How did that feel? Right. How did that feel when you scored the goal? Like, and the, oh my gosh, I felt amazing. People were high-fiving me. It was the greatest freaking thing ever. Blah, 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 blah. Now, what do you think that kid is going to feel or, or that person, right? It could be anybody. It doesn't have to be your kid. Imagine how that person feels talking to you, right? You got, what you really did was, is you guided them into the gratitude of their day. Right. And there's nothing cooler than being like, like, listen, like Justin, man, I, your podcast looks like it's blowing up, man. You're getting like guests, like you're just killing it, man. Tell what are you doing? What's your story? Mm-hmm. Like you automatically be like, oh, that's amazing. Right. Like the fact that you did research on me, I'm like, holy crap, man. That makes me feel like oh, I'm on top of the world. So a generative question, you can also use generative questions. Like, so with your girlfriend, right? Here's, here's, I told you best of what was the best of what is and the best of what could be. You could go to your girlfriend and be like, Hey, what are one, two or three things that I do in our relationship that make you feel most loved? Now what you're doing there, she has to basically, she, Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. Let it's me think about question. that. It is. And now she's reliving the things that you do. And how do you think she feels? And how do you think she's viewing you as she's reliving those things? Well, you do, you do this and you do this uh, and then you, then you do this. It makes me feel on top of the world. Now, what are you going to do with those one, two or three things? Keep doing them. <laughs> Keep doing <laughs> do more of them. <laughs> right. There's no guesswork. It's like, oh, well, like, well, gosh, when I take her out on a date, man, she loves that the most. Like I'm going to take her out on more dates. <laughs> right. Things like that. Um, the other thing too, is this, uh, the how, especially in relationships, right? A lot of men are like, I just don't know how to date my wife anymore. And I, you know, they'll come to me for coaching. I'm like, yeah, you do. No, no, I don't. We've really lost that flame. I was like, no, it's the things you're doing that has lost the flame. I was like, I, I was like a lot of people is spoiler alert, right? A lot of people have new problems or they perceive them as new problems, but they're not. They've already been successful in whatever it is that they're facing. They just don't know it. They need someone to help pull it out of them. So a guy's like, yeah, I just, you know, my wife and I, we haven't connected. I don't really feel like we're dating. Like I want to court her again. I want to date her again. Like I want to get to know her again. I'm like, well, what kind of questions are you asking her? I ask her how her day is. Yeah, don't do that. I was like, I was like, let me take you through a two minute exercise here. Right. I was like, where did you take your wife out on her first date? And then you'll see the guy change. He'll be like, I, I, I took her to Applebee's. That's where I took Jessica because we were in college. I took her Not to bad. Applebee's. <laughs> like you'll see the smile because they're reliving the first date. And I'll be like, okay, do you remember what she was wearing? And believe it or not, a lot of guys will remember what they were wearing. My, Jessica was wearing a white t-shirt and jeans. And, um, and I remember what her hair looked like that night. And I'll be like, what questions did you ask her on the first date? And he'll be like, oh yeah, I asked her how she grew up. And, and I asked her like, you know, what, what, what is her faith like? And I asked her, what are her friends like? What does she like to do outside of, you know, going to school? Or I, I asked her like, what are her dreams for the next five years? Or I'm like, you do know how to date your wife. Is it, is it accurate to think that your wife has probably evolved into maybe a bit of a different or a new person? Like, do you think 
asking her like, what are your dreams and your visions? Like, what, what would be so meaningful for you to do with me in the next five years? Do you think she would shut down on a question like that? Well, no, it's like, well, great. Well, treat your wife the same way you did when you first started dating. And that feeling actually won't go away. Well, I already know everything about her. I'm like, uh, do you? Because here's a list of 100 generative questions that I dare you to go ask her. And I guarantee you will find out more about this woman in three dates than you have in the past five years. And if you don't believe me, let's challenge you on it right now. And they'll do it. And they'll, they'll come back and they'll be like, oh my God, dude, we just had the most amazing date ever. I'm like, of course you did. You changed the environment, you changed the questions, you changed the connection. So you do know how to date your wife. Mm. Sometimes it's just unlocking that, but that's what generative questions are. It's meant to connect. Do you it's have that list of 100 generative questions? Like, can someone e easily Google that? I just built a brand new free course on it. Oh, uh, and it's free. Yes. It's free. Yes, yes. It's And it's in video format. And you also get the PDF of 25 of them. Okay. Um, cool. So yeah, if you just go to the dadedge.com forward slash 25 questions, two, five questions, just put in your name and email. It'll be sent to, you'll have access to it. Awesome. We'll link that in the show notes too. Well, I want to end with one more really great story that I think will put a bow on generative questions. I absolutely love this story. You used it during COVID and yep. you asked your, your family the whole, how might we versus why can't we? And so many people at this time were, were asking, you know, why can't we like, they were bummed, like, man, why can't I, I wish I could just go to concerts now, or I wish I could see more of my friends, or I wish all of this and that and that, and you reframed it. And you're, you and your family asked, how white might we? And I think the question was some, somewhere around like, how what might we make this, this time, um, rememberable or, yeah. you know, just this amazing adventure. And out of that came the story of 13 family adventures. Um, and I think you had two, two rules around that. I have a, a note on there for that and not, I can't quite remember what the two were rules were, but if you could back us up, tell me the question, the reframe question that you asked, and then go into the story of the 13 family adventures. Dude, you are an internet mole, my friend. Like, seriously, <laughs> the fact that I mean, you were like CIA. Of it's podcasters. it's it's all audio, man. I my, I pretty much man. just download. Well, you're easy because you have so much audio out there on different podcasts that you've been on. So I probably listened to, I don't know, twelve to fifteen hours of your podcast on one one point eight. I can I can two x you because you speak slower. Yeah. Um, so I can download a lot of a lot of your story and your information there. Um, but, but that's besides the point, getting back to the original question here. Yeah. No. So I, I love the question. And yeah, so, you know, I, I really, I think the theme around this is, you know, when you are, when you're struck with adversity and we start to go down this spiral of self-sabotage with poor questions, right. could be anything, could be losing the patience on your kids and then you self-sabotage and like, why am I not a patient father? You know, poor question, poor answers, downward spiral, spiral. When COVID hit back in March of 2020, basically in the U.S. here, and things started to shut down, excuse me, things started to shut down. My kids were out of school. We all felt trapped. It was like absolute paranoia. You know, like I remember going to Walmart with like a mask and safety glasses on. Like even if there's a, I'm one of those people now where even if there's a mask thing on the door, I will still walk in without a mask. If someone <laughs> threatens me or tells me to put it on, I might put it on. But otherwise, I'm like, I'm over this. I'm done. I'm just done, right? So, but when COVID hit, I think we were about 45 days into it. We had just spent like a few thousand dollars stockpiling our food because we literally thought the end of the world was coming. And I was like, God bless. I was like, and my wife and I, and even our family, we were asking ourselves poor questions. Like, why can't the world just go back to the way it was? Why can't we all be together? Like, why can't we go out and do the things we want to do? Like, this is just horrible, right? And you're asking questions and you just get, feel worse and worse and worse. So one day it was in the morning, my wife and I were having coffee out on our deck and I looked at her and I was like, you know, I really think we're asking ourselves the wrong questions. Cause we were doing the whole pity party thing, even out on the deck, you know, asking, you know, spiraling. And I was like, what if the question was, how might we, because that is a, that's a generative question. How might we, how might we connect in a way that we never have before? given the circumstances that we are faced with right now. Hmm. And then Jessica and I started thinking about things, things that we could do. 
How can we connect as a family in the simplest way? And then we posed the question at dinner that night with the kids. And we actually got out like a poster board, right? A big poster board. We started writing things down. We made it fun. And we started just jotting down ideas. And then it basically came to these themes and it, it, it went beyond actually the 13 adventures. But this all came from my kids. I can't remember who had the original idea. It wasn't mine. But my kids were like, what if we did a weekly adventure? It's like a weekly adventure. It's like, that's interesting. And somebody else said like, yeah, places we've never gone. Things we've never done. Like, what if we did a weekly adventure, places we've never been, things we've never done? What would that look like? And then we started listing places that we could go, right? We could go caving. Oh, we could go floating. We could go cliff jumping. We go kayaking. You know, we could go to this one place and do this thing, right? We could go do the, and literally we made a list. And the third, the top 13 things that were voted up, I took off every Wednesday in the summer, every Wednesday, I blocked the whole calendar off. Nothing got in the way. I didn't care what it was. And we went out and did those things and we took photos. And not only that, but we did fun things around the house. Like we made forts, we, we made barricades. We had Nerf gun wars. We had all, we did, we played four square out in the street as a family. It was amazing. The simplest things that you can do. And so what we, and here's how it culminated, right? And I will tell you, and I've posted this before. Thank you, COVID. You brought my family together like never before. Mm. While the rest of the world was in despair, we connected. Dude, my family, 2020 was freaking amazing. Like amazing. And it all came from the how might we question. Otherwise, I'd be sitting here telling you the worst year of our entire lives was 2020. Now, here's where the story ends. My wife asked me um, this past Father's Day, what do you want for Father's Day? I'm not a gift person at all. I'm like, give me a card, just card, you know, just tell me how much you love me. That's all I need. And I was like, and, I, and she's used to me saying that I never want gifts. I also don't like gifts because I don't like to open stuff in front of people because yeah, I'm kind of picky. And I'm like, oh, this sucks. Like, <laughs> I don't, I wouldn't really say that, but I'm like, I'm kind of picky about gifts. But um, I told my wife, I was like, you know what? I really want something. She's like, okay, what? In like 25 years, what do you want? And I'm like, here's what I want. I was like, we have over 800 photos of those adventures. What I'd like to do is pick out the top 100 photos, me and you and the kids. And then I want a freaking mural downstairs and I wanted to say something. I don't know what it is. Like, thank you COVID or what? I don't care what it is. I was like, I want a mural of these top photos, basically staking our flag in the ground saying, screw you COVID. Look what you did for us. Right. And I came home from, a, and I, I told my wife that father's day came and went, it didn't happen. I, it was a big project. Didn't think anything of it. Came home from a trip with my son we went out to Vegas in July, had to do a podcast and my son went downstairs to his room. He's like, dad, and nobody else was home yet. He's like, dad, have you been downstairs yet? I'm like, no. He's like, come here. Went downstairs. It's huge, huge, perfectly square. I think there's 80 pictures, wow. little individual pictures all in their own frame. And in the middle, I can't, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it says something about thank you for the adventures. Right. And there's some other stuff in there. And I freaking lost it, man. Like <clears throat> getting emotional just talking about it. Because to me, our family freaking won, man. Like that was so just, just to relive every single moment as I looked at every single picture. I was like, dude, when the rest of the world was freaking out. Marriages were ending. People were losing their cool. Alcohol was at an all-time high. People were doing more drugs than they ever have just to escape the stress and, the, and numb themselves. We did this. I have never in my life been more proud of my family, of my wife who went to the trouble of hanging all that. And it all came from a question. That's it. I couldn't sit here and tell you today that, that any of that would have happened unless we had interrupted that self-sabotage thought process and decided intentionally to ask a very different question. So that's what I encourage like your listeners to really think about. If you're faced with something, something that even seems insurmountable, change the question. You might completely and totally change the trajectory of where you're going, right? That's it. 
Larry freaking Hagner, man. Dude, that was <laughs> such a blast. Um, I appreciate the amazing story there. Did, did you post a picture of that on your Instagram? Um, yes, I did. Okay, perfect. I'll go back. I'll find it. Uh, we'll link it in the show notes. If anybody wants to check that out, I, ah, dude, um, such a pleasure. Um, I'm so glad that we were able to, to make this happen. Really excited. Um, if people want to connect with you, man, where's the best place for, for them to go? Uh, obviously the dad edge, uh, dot com is easiest thing. We've got all kinds of resources there. Like I said, we've got the, I just, I just created that free resource on generative questions. Um, if you go to the data edge.com forward slash 25 questions, two, five questions, you'll get it. Um, got a plethora of other resources there, like our patients course podcast. Um, I also have a free email series called 21 days to an extraordinary marriage. You can also use these if you're not married in, in a relationship. Um, it's just 15 emails over 21 days to where it basically just teaches you a few, diff- few basic skills that you might need a refresher on. And then three challenges to go out and execute those skills. That's awesome. And I'll plug it again for um, my soon-to-be dads out there, even people looking to um, to you know potentially consider parenthood, or um, you know people that are out there that have kids already. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy your podcast, and and that is the Dad Edge podcast. Same on Instagram, the Dad Edge. You can find them um, pretty easily there. Super incredible. Really excited, Larry. My final question for you: If you had the opportunity to teach a 16 week class to a group of graduating college seniors on a course that isn't normally taught, what would you teach and how would you teach it? 16, <laughs> 16 weeks. Um, I would say uh, communication in your relationship. So I have a course on that called uh, creating, creating a, an extraordinary marriage through elevated communication, connection, and intimacy, basically, but you can also use it. Um, obviously I have to tweak the intimacy part a little bit, but, um, it's a course on relationship skills within communication. Right. Um, and it's actually, it's 10 modules. So my course might be like, you know, 12 weeks because I do an intro and then like an ending to it. But, um, that's what I would, because as you navigate life, communication is such a foundational tool. And most of us are going about communication, unfortunately, the wrong way, but we just don't know it. We're just doing the best we can. We're doing the best we can, but we just don't know that like, oh, wow, like I could actually elevate connection with other people. Uh, if I just did this little thing, yeah, you can, and it'll serve you for the rest of your life. And that's the stuff, unfortunately, they don't teach in college. Yes. Agreed. I can confirm that. Um, coming from college not too long ago, I never had a course presented in that way. And I totally would have took it. Larry Hagner, everybody. Once again, that is the dad edge.com, the dad edge on Instagram or the dad edge podcast, which I would encourage everybody to check out. Larry, it's been such a pleasure, man. Back at you, my friend. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you like this conversation today, be sure to subscribe so you'll be notified about new episodes. If you want to connect with me, send me a message on Instagram. I'm at Justin Lee Peters. You can find show notes with links to everything we discussed today at justinpeters.co. This episode was produced by Gabby Dimeke. I'm your host, Justin Peters. Thanks for tuning in.